Okay, welcome back to the workshop. My name's Sean Evely, and in today's video, we're going to be cutting a dovetail like a master craftsman. In part one, I showed you some beginner's mistakes, and I tried to correct some of those for you. And in part two, we did some dovetail tips and tricks. Both of those are really good videos, so if you missed them, make sure you check them out. A link to those videos will be in the description down below. But in this video, I'm going to be showing you the whole dovetail cutting process. So if you want to follow along in your workshop, then feel free to do it. It should be a really good video, and I hope it's helpful to you. But before we get into it, this video is actually sponsored. And the video is sponsored by me. So if you want to support the channel and cut dovetails just like me, then make sure you pick yourself up a very nice 1 in 8 ratio dovetail mark. Every woodworker likes nice tools and this is no exception. It's very smooth, it's got some lovely curves, beautiful contours, it comes in black ebony and African paduke, and it even comes in a gift box, so it'd be a perfect gift for you or someone else. So, I, why not? You know, and if you were to buy one of these, you'll be cutting perfect dovetails every single time. Not a chance. So if you want to support the channel and pick yourself up a 1 in 8 ratio dovetail marker, did I mention it's made by me? Make sure you click the link in the description down below to my Etsy store. And yeah, let's get on with the video. So if you want to follow along at home, these are all the tools I'm going to be using. A wheel marking gauge, a square, a 1 in 8 ratio dovetail marker, a wooden mallet, a fret saw, a crosscut saw, which is not 100% necessary. I'm going to be using this to remove the waste on the end of the tailboard, but you can use a dovetail saw. Then I'll be using a chisel set. I'm going to be using a ruler, a marking knife, a pencil, some masking tape, and a number four plane. Okay, so I got a bit of ash and a bit of walnut, two contrasting bits of wood, so you're going to see the dovetail really cleanly. So normally when people are cutting dovetails, the first step they would do is put the boards on top of each other, and then lay the marking gauge on top, measure the thickness, and then scribe that all the way around the board. But what we're gonna do is actually mark the dovetail first. So, we're gonna put it in the vise, and I'm looking at the grain here, because when I flush the joint off after, if the grain is going upwards, when I flush it off, then I'm gonna get some tear out. So I want the grain to be going away from me. So I spoke about dovetail layout and what looks good in the beginner's mistakes video. So if you haven't seen that, make sure you check it out. But roughly this is what I do. I always go in five millimeters from each end of the tailboard. A lot of people leave the end pins too small and there's no supporting material on the outside. So if your dovetails are slightly too tight when you put the tailboard in, then um, the pin can break off. So you've got to have a substantial pin on the outside bigger than the ones on the inside. When you've done dovetails for a long time, you get really good at working out how many dovetails look good in a joint. And with a board this wide, three dovetails would look good. I'm going to roughly divide it by three, so it's nine centimetres wide. The top of my pins are always three millimeters wide, and that is because it's just big enough for my marking knife to fit in angled when scribing the top of the pins, but it's also small enough, it looks hand cut, and a router bit shank definitely won't be able to fit in that gap. You can use calipers, a lot of people uh, do the calipers trick, uh, which also works very well, but I've got used to using a ruler. Now it's time to mark the side of the dovetails. So remember, we haven't marked out our marking gauge line yet, which is very important. So you want to make sure these tail lines go far enough uh, that they'll go past that. So I've got my dovetail marker on, and I'm going to line up my pencil to the line we made on top and mark down. So now it's time to add the marking gauge line. You want to set your marking gauge to just over the thickness of the tail board. And that means the tails and the pins will overhang by half a millimeter. So hopefully you can see the dovetails clearly with the pencil. The reason we mark them before the marking gauge line is so that we can mark in between the dovetails and only mark the waist. Normally people run the marking gauge all the way along the tail board, all the way around. And then when you're making a box or flushing off the joint after, you've got to keep flushing until you remove that marking gauge line. And by doing that, you're removing a lot of material, which takes longer. But also, if you did an undercut on the joint, the more material you remove from the faces, you can start to reveal the undercut. And then it'll end up looking like a gap at the bottom of the pins. So, what I'm going to do is hopefully the camera can pick it up. I'm going to make a small cut on the end. 
and then jump to the first pin and I'm slightly rolling the wheel back and forth. You don't, you want to do this slowly because you don't want to go over the pin. Then I'm going to go to the second pin, slightly rolling the wheel and then I'm going to go to the last. Now you only need to do this on the show face because on the back will be in the inside of the joint so you can run the marking gauge all along the back because that's on the inside of the joint and obviously you've got to do the corners as well. Okay so all the marking out is done on the tailboard and it's time to cut the dovetails. You've got to commit to cutting straight. If you're slightly wandering off the line, do not turn the saw because then you're going to have a curved wall. It's got to be straight and it doesn't matter if you don't stick to that ratio. You probably won't notice in the final joint. So I'm using my nail on my thumb to guide the saw and I'm going to run back and forth with the saw flat. With a 14 tooth TPI, if I angle the saw up, it can be quite hard to start that cut and it might catch a bit. So I always put it flat and run it slowly, very lightly on the top until it creates a groove. And then once I got that groove started, I can add a bit more pressure. Okay, now it's time to remove the waste, and I'm doing this with a fret saw, which is a really quick way of removing the waste, because then you've only got a little bit of material at the end to pair back to. And now with my crosscut saw, I'm going to remove the ends. You can do this with a dovetail saw, but obviously a crosscut saw is going to cut a bit nicer. I'm not actually cutting on the line here, on the marking gauge line, because it's pretty difficult to follow such a neat knife line. So I'm gonna cut off it and then chisel back to the line. You wanna go very lightly at the end because you definitely don't wanna cut into the tail because then you're gonna see that curve in the final joint. So now it's time to chisel back to that marking gauge line. So I'm gonna put the tail board on top of a scrap board so then I don't damage my workbench and I'm going to clamp it on top of the workbench leg so I'm going to get the maximum amount of power with each mallet hit. You want the largest chisel you can fit into the bottom of the pin for the final cut but I'm not going to start off with that, I'm going to nibble away with the free mail. If I was using the smallest chisel on the marking gauge line because it's got such a small reference area it's really easy to turn the chisel and not be completely square. With the largest chisel, I can reference the whole thing in that marking gauge line, and then I know it's definitely square. So I've went halfway down from the first side, now I flip the board over and I'm going in from the other side, again, going down halfway. You don't want to take too much material off at a time. The bigger chunks you take off, the more likely the chisel is going to be pushed back into the wood because of the, the angle of the bevel. If the chisel is pushed back, then you're going to ruin the marking gauge line and it will show up as a gap in the final joint. So you want to nibble little bits at a time. Halving the distance between uh, the edge and the marking gauge line until there's so little material in front of the marking gauge line, you can put the chisel into that and then do the final cut. And you want to keep on looking to make sure you're cutting plumb or slightly angled outwards to do an undercut. I'm actually going to change the orientation of the board to have the show face towards me. So then I can see if I'm definitely cutting on the line. If I were to go wrong, I definitely want it to be on the inside rather than the outside. So now there's not a lot of material in front of the marking gauge line. I'm going to put it in that slot and then pair down. Now I'm going to make sure that the surface is flat and do a slight undercut. Now you should be able to see on the edge of the wall 
a very fine white line and you want to see that that is uh, the marking gauge line and if you see that white line all the way around then you know you've hit it and you definitely don't want to go deeper than that white line you just want to make sure that the material on the inside is the same level or slightly below if it's slightly higher than the white line then when you put the pins in it won't seat properly and then you're going to have high spots and there'll be a gap. Here's a tip when pairing back to the marking gauge line. If you get a square board, now it has to be square, I'd recommend using one that has come straight from the planar thicknesser and you line that up on the marking gauge line, you can clamp it in place. And then with your chisel you can use this as a reference wall and then push the chisel against this face and then you can hammer down then all the bottoms of the pins and the end pins will be completely flat and if you do it right and the board is completely square then you won't need to do any undercutting and it should actually be quicker so that's a good tip especially if you don't like chiseling freehand now because I didn't use that backboard trick uh, to cut plum I'm going to do a slight undercut in the pins to ensure there are no high spots I go halfway from one side and flip the board around you definitely don't want to go beyond halfway because if you slightly go too far then you can blow the grain out on the other side and use your hand as a fence if your hand wasn't there and you were just pushing like this then you can definitely slip and go too far and then cause some chip out but if you use your hand as a fence and you use these two fingers to slowly ease the chisel in then you definitely won't go too far now they're done it's time to mark out the pins. Now some people when marking out the pins on the tailboard they would cut a rebate where the tails are so then the tails lock in place on the top of the pin board and it's really easy to locate them. But here's another way of doing that. I think it's probably the most easiest and it engages really well. So I use some masking tape on the back of the tailboard. I'll put some masking tape going over the marking gauge line. I'll do about three strips so it's very quick and then with your marking gauge which is still at the same depth you can run over that masking tape so now I'm just going to snip off the ends because you don't need that so what we've done there is basically created a rebate by adding material instead of removing material from the tail area Okay, so now it's time to use the plane. We're going to put that on its side and we're going to get the pin board making sure the grain is going away so then it's easier to flush off at the end. I'm going to make the pin board exactly the same height as the plane. Lock that in place. As you can see, that masking tape is giving us a really nice sort of lock engagement, if that makes sense. And it's not going anywhere. So all we need to do is make sure that either end is lined up so I get a chisel I reference it off the pin board and then I hug the end on the tail board and then I bring it in until it engages and then once it's in place you can get your marking knife and then mark the pins so you want to put a lot of pressure down because you don't want it to move the first pass you want it to be very light with the knife if you go too deep it can follow the grain so you want to create a channel lightly and then press deeper and we need to mark down from those lines we just created. Okay, so now we marked out those lines with your marking gauge. We can now mark out the lines, but because the board is a different thickness, I need to change the thickness of the marking gauge to just over the thickness of the tail board. I'm only gonna mark the tail area. So I'm gonna roll into that stop you want to go all the way near to the end and when you're at the end just roll the wheel don't want to go too far and then I'm going to jump over that pin which is only three millimeters even though it's so small you definitely can see that line in the final joint if you don't plane it away so I've jumped to the next tail mark it there jump to the third tail now on the tail board because you've got the end pins you don't need a mark and gauge line on the ends because you'll definitely see that in the final joint but you do want one all the way along the back it's time to cut them out and I need my square so I'm gonna put the board 
in the vise, making sure it's square to help me as much as possible to cut plumb because these cuts are probably the most important cuts when cutting dovetails because the tails you can go off the line because you haven't cut the pins yet but you need to cut the pins to fit the tails so these need to be really accurate again I'm using my fingers to guide the cut and I want to be on the inside of the tails and the outside of the pins if it helps you can mark the waste area with a pencil Okay, so this time, because the tail area is bigger than the pin area, I'm going to be using the two biggest chisels, the smaller one to remove most of the waste first, and then the largest one to go into the marking gauge line. You want your largest chisel to fit in the marking gauge line, so then you know it's definitely square. Little chunks at a time. So now I'm going to put the large chisel into the marking gauge line. As you're getting close to the pin, you want to angle the chisel slightly to follow the angle of the pin. If you don't, then it's going to eat away some of that material. Okay, so I've gone in from both sides and now I'm going to check that the area in the middle is square. And if there's any high spots, which there are, I'm going to do a little undercut. And I don't want to go too much under the baseline because then you're going to weaken the joint. Ideally you want it perfectly level but that's very difficult to do so it's better to go slightly under than over the marking gauge line. And you want to clean up the corners because if there's any fuzzy areas there then that can prevent the tails from seating properly. Okay so now the pins are cut but before we fit the dovetails I'm going to add a chamfer on the bottom of them and because these are through dovetails and not half blind dovetails you can't start the chamfer at the end. If they're a half blind then you wouldn't see the end grain. You can start the chamfer at the end of the board but we got to start it about three millimeters in. Also the tails overhang the pin board so you can't start one millimeter in because that's where uh, the edge of the board will be. So I'm starting about three millimeters in. This will help locate the tails in the pin board. If there is any uh, fuzz in the corners of the pin board, that chamfer uh, will allow the tails to seat properly and uh, any you know, kind of sawdust can go in that chamfered area. And make sure you're holding the chisel at the end. If you're holding at the handle, you can slip and then cut your hand. So you've got to hold it near the tip so then if you do overshoot, you're not going to cut yourself. Okay, so the dovetail is now cut and before we glue it together, I just want to talk about the main process again of this video, which was only marking the waist. And the way we did that was marking out the tails before we uh, used the marking gauge. Normally it's done the other way around. As you can see, the benefit of doing that is already that there is no marking gauge line there. So once we glue it together, we won't need to flush off the face of the board to remove that marking gauge line. We just need to remove the protruding pins and the tails. If you wanted to make protruding dovetails, I've never done them, but I think they look really nice. Mike Pekovic from Fine Woodworking does them quite often. With it protruding, you add a small chamfer around the ends and it creates a really nice looking joint. But if you wanted to do that, you obviously can't flush the joint off at the end because the tails are protruding and you wouldn't be able to get rid of that marking gauge line if you wanted to. So if you wanted to do protruding dovetails, then I would highly recommend doing this method of only marking the waist because then you're gonna have, you know, some quite ugly marking gauge lines that you can't get rid of because you can't flush off the joint. I think I've explained that well, hopefully. All right, and now it's time to glue. Now I spoke about this in my dovetail tips and tricks video and that is when doing dovetails you've got to make these clamping blocks which are these grooved kind of pieces of wood that attach to the tail board and these grooves allow the protruding pins somewhere to go. But these uh, high spots basically allow the tails to properly seat at the bottom of the pin board. So what I'm going to do is I've got type on one. If you want a good job done, type on one. Always remember that. I add glue to all the faces of the dovetail 
even the end grain because I think it does add some strength and even if it doesn't add strength let's say there is a hairline gap between the tails and the pins that glue will fill that gap and make it look like it's uh, properly seated. Glue can also swell the joint so if your joint doesn't fit perfectly the glue or once you take out the clamps the next day you might have found that actually it's swollen the tails and the pins a little bit and then caused it to actually um, fit better. I've got a piece of veneer here, I'm just going to spread it around the walls. Okay, now the tailboard. It's a bit harder to get in these gaps. I'll do these faces first. And I stand the board on it on its end so then I get as least amount of the glue dripping out of the joint. Pretty sure I got glue everywhere. Okay, so I've got even squeeze out there. Those high spots are really helping the tails seat into the pin board. And also I'm gonna add a clamp sideways because that can help the end pins close up to the tails. All right, so we'll leave that overnight and see what it looks like in the morning. Okay, so the joint is all glued up and now it's time to flush it off and see how the joint looks. If you're using a block plane for this, it can actually be quite hard because it hasn't got a lot of weight and mass behind it. So if the piece is clamped into your vise and you've got a number four, I find the number four easier for this. And remember, we don't need to do a lot of flushing off because I don't need to remove those marking gauge lines. Because there isn't any. Good. Okay, and that is the end of the dovetail series. I hope this series has been helpful to you. If you're new to cutting dovetails, I recommend watching all the videos if you haven't because there's different tips in each and it should help you cut better dovetails. And don't forget, if you wanna buy a dovetail marker made by me, then there is a link in the description down below to my Etsy store. If you've got any questions about cutting dovetails that I didn't cover in this series, then make sure you comment down below and I'll reply to your questions. If you found the series helpful, it'd be great if you could share it with your friends and give this video a like. And of course, if you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe. All right, thank you for sticking to the end of the video and I'll see you next week for the Christmas ornament build.